Now I wanted to talk about using hand tools to create a food plot. And you'll see food plot videos out there from time to time by you know, how to use hand tools to create a food plot. And it, and it sounds you know, easy, let's just go do this. Um, we're gonna use these hand tools to create an open space, throw some seed down and we're gonna have a great catch and we're gonna have this sweet little honey hole for a food plot that rarely ever works out that way. So a bit of caution about using hand tools that unless you meet still the minimum requirements of establishing a good food plot, which would be good seed to soil contact, weed control, getting enough sunlight to that plot and choosing the appropriate type of seed for that plot, using more of a monoculture because if you put too much of a blend, each is fighting each other and, uh, and you don't want 15 seeds in a blend, 10 seeds in the blend, you need to have a purpose for that food plot. So having a purpose, creating sunlight to the plot, good seed to soil contact, and making sure that you control your weeds. And of course, you have to have moisture to that location too. But let's talk about using hand tools. Now, let's say you have a space that has a lot of leaves on it. Well, you could go in there with a hand rake and just keep raking over and over again to get those leaves off the plot. How about a leaf blower? It's a battery operated DeWalt right here. This, a lot easier to get those leaves and debris and you probably already have one at home or a lot of people do anyways. So if you're clearing leaves and getting something off, I'd prefer, much prefer to use this than this hand rake right here. Now, you have to look at though, going back, what does it mean if there's a bunch of leaves on the food plot? Typically means that there's a lot of canopy over the food plot, leaves are drop, dropping from the trees. Usually those leaves aren't blowing from 150 yards across the field and settling in an open area and you're cleaning the leaves. So it sounds great, let's use a leaf blower and, and blow out this spot. Unfortunately, that signifies typically that there's a lot of canopy. So what does that take? Let's say you have this perfect little honey hole in the woods. And I'm saying a honey hole, I still want that to be 50 feet by 40 feet, you know, 2,000 square feet, something like that. 2,000 square feet is still only 1 20th of an acre, but it might be enough if you pick the right seed to get a food plot growing. So in that case, we might initially clear those leaves off with a hand rake or even a leaf blower, and then we get it down to soil. What do you do next? Well, because the leaves are there, that signifies again that you don't have enough sunlight. So you have to use a saw. Now, I prefer to use a chainsaw. Here's my old steel right here. I have other steels that I use regularly. But bottom line is you have to use a chainsaw or a saw to make sure you look to the southerly sky. Get about a 90 degree window with your arms and just imagine if you get 30 degrees here, 30, 30, it average, averages up to or adds up to 90 degrees. Get enough sunlight on that plot to now support whatever food plot or whatever food plot variety seed you want to throw in there. Now, some food plot variety seeds are a little bit more shade tolerant than others, and but that doesn't mean they don't need full sun. Clover, for example, is more shade tolerant rye, but you still want to have four or five hours sun at least per day. Something like brassica. Brassica needs full sun. Soybeans need full sun. In that case, you want to get six, seven, eight hours per day. Bottom line, still a lot of sun. And if you're hitting that six, seven, eight hours a day, that's where you want more of a 90 degree wedge. But even clover, rye, still has its limits. You still need to get a lot of sun in there. So using a chainsaw, handheld rake, leaf blower. Now you're getting that soil exposed. Now what happens then? You're getting that soil exposed to sunlight. Maybe you're clearing area out in the field. Maybe you've used a handheld line tripper like we have right here. Maybe you've burned that down to the ground you're getting sunlight, it's already there. You've cle cleared that old weed debris, you're getting sunlight down there, but now what happens? When you get sunlight to soil, you get weed growth. And you can clear an area out of the woods or clear an area out of the fields. You get that work down, whether you're using hand tools, a line trimmer to get those weeds out, even a sickle, if you just wanna use a hand sickle and break it down, you're still, now that you're getting sunlight to the soil or near soil, you're gonna get more weed growth. And that's where your problem comes in. Because if you don't get those weeds out, you're gonna be in trouble. So what you're left with in that case, you can go rent a rototiller. You can rototill out that 20th of an acre, 10th of an acre, quarter acre food plot, rototill it out, and then hand rake when weeds come into the future, just like you're clearing for your garden, get those weeds out of there, hand pull them. You can do that, that, that is a way. But you have to take care of your weeds, and we'll talk about a better way, at least with the weeds when they're concerned, here in a second. You have weeds taken care of, you have good seed to soil contact, you're getting sunlight to that area, now it takes planting before rain. A lot of 
a lot of food plot seed varieties that you plant, you're going to have to plant with moisture in the forecast. For example, if you plant clover in the spring, you can get clover to come up. But if you get summer drought, it can kill that clover very easily. So you have to use a cover crop of oats, something like that. And then you have to mow those oats out. I've mowed an acre at a time with a handheld line trimmer like this steel right here. And that takes about two hours per acre from experience. So I want you to think about all these variables. And I keep going through another step here. When it comes to weed control, what do you do? You can rototill over and over again. You can come in here with a hand rake, get those weeds off. And the area I'm talking about in the woods when you remove leaf debris, get that sunlight down there by cutting trees around there, get the soil exposure, you're going to get weeds. You could till that spot. Could use a backpack sprayer. Backpack sprayer with herbicide, glyphosate, two quarts per acre. So the thing about a backpack sprayer, you're only gonna kill about an eighth of an acre at a time because the inefficiency of that backpack sprayer. It's one nozzle, you're going back and forth. It takes a lot of chemical. There's usually four gallons in the backpack in order to spray. So you're really not spraying a lot, if you think about that, at a time. Just by eighth of an acre is perfect for that uh, four gallon backpack sprayer. Two quarts per acre, you add the appropriate amount of chemical. So you have an eighth of an acre, you're really only a I hope it makes sense, but you're only a quarter of a quart in that backpack, and then you're killing that eighth of an acre. We'll talk about calibrating your sprayer in another video. If you look up calibrating your sprayer, you'll find videos that I've created about how to do that. It's not an ounces per gallon thing. It's how many gallons it takes to spread with your given machine, whether it's a backpack sprayer, an ATV, or side-by-side, -side, how many gallons it takes to actually spray an acre and then you're adding the appropriate amount of chemical per acre. That's, that's how you do that. That's how you calibrate and how you spray. So you come on over here, we have a big UTV sprayer right here. We use, we have one on the side-by-side -side outside that we use. And then also this is an ATV sprayer right here. ATV sprayer I prefer. Now, of course, not a hand tool. Um, I've used backpack sprayers in the past. I've had them leak all the back, down the back side of me, and I just don't prefer to use them. Uh, the seals eventually go bad, and it, again, it's very inefficient. This isn't a bad spray right here. It's got a fold out boom. It's got five nozzles on here. What's great about those five nozzles is they really reach out. They allow you to be efficient. This is a 25 gallon sprayer. Now an ATV costs money. This one was a used one. I got it back many years ago, but it was uh, cost me $3,400. So it was pretty expensive as far as hand tools go and, and equipment, but I prefer it much over a backpack sprayer. I used to have an ATV back in the day. I wish I still had it. It was a Honda 350 Rancher and it cost me about $3,000 new. I sold it for 1,500 used and I really wish I would have never done that because I'd love to have that. Uh, now it was only two wheel drive. It turned on a dime and uh, it was lightweight, a very good spraying machine. But bottom line is, once you get that sunlight exposed to the ground, whether you're weed whipping that, sickling it out, blowing it with a leaf blower, raking it, cutting down some timber to get sunlight to it in the woods, you have to take care of the weeds. So what I prefer to do instead of tilling over and over again, going to rent a tiller, is I want to spray with a backpack sprayer or an ATV sprayer, if you can borrow that from somebody, put it on a lawn tractor or whatever it might be, but get that sprayed out and you have to wait a while for the sunlight to come in. So going back to the timing thing, this is perfect to start now in May because you can clear that area. And then towards the end of May, once you get sunlight to there, to that ground over about a four week period, you're going to get, going to get weed growth. Then you can spray it one time with two quarts per acre of glyphosate. Now in an area that hasn't had appreciable weed growth for a long time, then you're going to get weeds growing after that four or five week time. You spray it, you could probably wait about eight weeks and spray again and then plant at the same time. That gets you into a fall spring. A lot of those little plots, I like using our clover blends. We have our perennial clover blend over there that we use quite a bit. And it's a perennial mix, it's got clover, chicory, and some other, other goodies in there. But that's a great crop to put in a small plot like that because it withstands a lot of grazing pressure. When it gets cold, it starts diminishing growth, stops growing altogether, and then you can throw 200 pounds per acre of rye on it. So in an eighth of an acre plot, put about 25 pounds out per acre or per plot on an eighth of an acre, and that works out perfectly. And so that gives your, your plot in the fall a one-two punch. We have the clover coming in, and then you have that rye following up. You put that out about September, around Labor Day, to end of Labor Day, or end of September, depending on where you're at in the country. So that's a great one-two punch. But again, to get there, you have to get rid of the weed, weeds. 
Now to plant that clover in the fall, the clover is not gonna do anything for you this year. That's gonna be a next year type thing. So you wanna get it established. So I look at a cool season annual. We have a product specific to that where it's a brassica clover blend. You plant that in August sometime and then you're left with clover the following year. You have the brassica for that uh, really good attraction near the fall. But on a little plot like that, that brassica is gonna get eaten down really quick. So you might wanna just go buy 100 pounds of oats per acre Plant that around Labor Day, put your clover down, and then you're left with that clover blend the following year. We also have a fall power greens blend that's really good in leafy goodness, greens. You want to follow that up a month later with 150 pounds of rye per acre. You can establish that clover blend right underneath it all. You can put it in right at the same time. That's around August 1st and August, depending on where you're at in the country, uh, later towards the south. But you put that in there, you're left with a clover base the following year. You kill the rye out, mow it. You can actually mow it to kill it with a handheld line trimmer, a sickle, get rid of the rye, and then you're left with pure clover going into the following year. I like planting in the fall too because you can take advantage of fall moisture patterns. You get clover established, get your food plot established. You only get increasing moisture as the fall progresses. You get another great shot of moisture in the spring. And by the time summer drought hits the following year, then your clover will be thick enough and have its roots established enough to withstand any drought that mother nature can throw its way. Should you be playing with hand tools? There's a case can be, that can be made that you can do so. I like the example of the plot in the woods where you're blowing leaves out of the way, not using a rake, using a saw or chainsaw to get sunlight to the ground. You're coming back in with a backpack sprayer, spraying a couple times throughout the summer to keep it down to soil because once you get that sunlight, those weeds are going to come in. Then you're planting in the late summer by establishing a base layer of clover with a cool season annual like oats, like our fall power greens, like the brassica blend. You're left with pure clover the following year. If it gets light going into September, you can add 150 pounds of rye right over the top of it. You've got sunlight to it. You've taken control of your weeds. You're planting at an appropriate time to take advantage of moisture patterns. And you're using a product that's specific or a type of seed blend that's specific to a small area. You know, no beans, no glamour crops that have 15 different crops in there or different seed varieties. You're using really strong leafy green mixtures, following up with some rye, creating that clover blend. And then even then you're using rye to safeguard that plot in the future. But you're going into it with realistic expectations that even though this is a very small plot, you can get a good plot growing. But again, you have to have sun, you have to get rid of the weeds, you have to plant when you can take advantage of moisture patterns, and you have to plant the right seed blend for a small area like that. And you too can use hand tools to create food plots. Might use a chainsaw. I mean, heck, you could use a handsaw if you wanted to, or some type of saw. It might take a little while, or handsaw like that. I prefer to use a chainsaw. You can always use a backpack sprayer. Heck, they have the little ones that you can pump up that I think are about a two gallon sprayer. You can carry those around and spray if you want. That's a lot cheaper too. So you can plant food pots in a budget. You're not going to be able to plant very appreciable plots with much, but you can get it done. That's a way you can use a combination of hand tools. But again, it goes back to the basics of food plots. And if you follow those basics and always keep those in mind, seed to soil contact, sunlight, increasing moisture patterns, taking care of your weed controls, picking the right seed for your food plot, then you will have success even with hand tools on a small scale. And it can be done all this year still. You have plenty of time to have a great little food plot and a honey hole right next to a stand location for this fall. Now, I don't know if you've checked out our main website lately, whitehabitatsolutions.com, but we've really had a lot going on, including hats, books, our web class, and certainly our new seed company, WHS Wildlife Blends. When you click on seed on our site, it'll take you right to our brand new site for the seed company. We have all 12 blends available. So check it all out, though. I encourage you. I appreciate you checking it out, whether you buy anything or not. Really appreciate you visiting the site and uh, seeing what's going on and continue to watch because we have big things coming later this year.